Welcome back. Um, we're continuing section one three. Um, we've already talked about simple random sampling in the previous video, and now we're going to look at other acceptable sampling methods. Um, sometimes we just can't use simple random sampling. So sometimes people use methods other than simple random sampling to choose their samples. So again, choosing samples is collecting data. How are we collecting information? Um, so sometimes simple random sampling is just too challenging to too challenging or too hard to obtain. Um, sometimes the researcher isn't willing to leave um, certain representations up to chance. So sometimes we might want to make sure there's so many teachers in our sample or so many people age 20 to 30, things like that. We might have characteristics that are important to us. So let's look at a couple different sampling methods that are also considered good. The first one we're going to call systematic random sampling. So this is still random. It's just a little bit different than fully random, like pulling a number out of a hat. Um, this is a method of choosing your sample so that the sampled items are equally spaced throughout the population. So an advantage would be that items near each other or like students sitting next to each other, things like that, um, are often near each other. Um, so, so like items are often near each other. And so this can help avoid a biased sample. So in some examples to think about this is like choosing every fifth person in line. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, right? One, two, three, four, five, and we choose the fifth person. That's equally spaced. Um, if it were items on like an assembly line, like in a factory, just pick something every 10 minutes, right? That's equally spaced as well. So those are different ways of doing equally spaced. It's still random. It's just not as random as pulling a number out of a hat. Um, I have a couple more good methods. Um, the next one is called cluster sampling. Um, this is when we, um, a method that chooses several items that are somehow already naturally grouped together. They're in clusters, right? Clusters are groups. So let's talk about the process and then we'll do the advantage and disadvantage. So we find these subgroups, which would be called our cluster. So these are like groups within our sample and they kind of already naturally exist. Um, and then this is an okay method because once we pick the clusters, we're going to randomly pick those clusters. So that's what makes this still an okay method. Every good method will have some sort of element of random. And then we'll just combine our clusters to make a sample. So someone might do this because it saves time and money. It's also convenient. Um, so clusters could be like fruit, like fruit that's like grapes. They're already clustered together or a class of students, right? As a class, you're already clustered together rather than choosing individual students. The problem is, is clusters often have like members. And so that might increase our chance of a bias sample, right? Students in the same class might be a little similar. But that's again, random will help take care of that because we are gonna choose more than one cluster. We won't choose a single class, we'll choose like five classes or 10 classes. So that helps with the bias. So we'll look at an example as you, after you get this definition down. So a winemaker um, wants to study grapes. So this goes in right, Grapes come in clusters naturally in one of his vineyards to test sugar content. So that would be like a variable. Just to remind us of some old vocab words, right? That's our response variable from the previous section. We're gonna have grapes and then measure their sugar content. So that's like our output. And he would like the sample to have a thousand grapes and has decided that a thousand random grapes is just too con time consuming, right? We might, we go around the farm and collecting individual grapes is just gonna take us forever. So instead we're gonna use cluster sampling. We know there's 40 grapes in each bunch. So we're gonna make those our clusters. So our clusters, right, would be a bunch of grapes. 
we might not know the word bunch, right? But grapes look like this. They come in little bunches. Right? That's our bunch of grapes. And so we're not going to get a thousand clusters because we only want a thousand grapes. So how many clusters do we need? We need a thousand total grapes. And there's 40 in each cluster, so we'll just divide by 40. And we should get 25. So instead of collecting 1,000 grapes, we're going to collect 1,000, 25 clusters. And as long as we do that randomly, it's fine. So how should he decide which clusters to pick? Right, he's not going to pick the first 25 he sees. He's going to randomly pick them. And the element of random makes this okay. And that's cluster sampling. So it can save us time, right? Imagine collecting 25 versus 1,000. It's definitely faster. And I have one final good method. And that is called stratified sampling. So this is a procedure that chooses items from different subpopulations. So this is a population within your population. So it might be like a smaller group of people. Could be age. Um, career, um, gender, things like that. Um, and so we want to make sure that they come up in this, they make up the same proportion of the sample as they do in the population. And proportions are just percents. So if 20% of my population is teachers, then I want 20% of my sample to be teachers. And we'll see that in the example below. But first the process, we're going to identify those subpopulations. Um, that's going to vary depending on what our interests are. Uh, and then from each subpopulation, we'll find a sample size proportional to the size of their subpopulation. So again, 20% teachers in the population and the sample. Uh, and as, this is allowed as long as we randomly choose within those subpopulations. It's almost like we have many samples within the sample. And then we'll go ahead and combine them to make the sample. And the advantage is if you have an important characteristic, you can make sure it's properly represented. And another thing that's really nice about this is sometimes you might study the little groups within the sample. So this can be a really good sampling method if you want to examine individual groups as well. So let's see how this works. I think there's two examples. We have 57.8% of students at Chabot are female and 42.2% are male. And we're going to have a sample of size 450. And gender is an important characteristic for us. So we want gender to be properly represented. So how many male and female students do we need in the sample? So I'm not gonna just randomly select 450 and like cut it in half. I'm gonna make it proportional. So proportional here means we're going to take 57.8% of 450 should be female. And in case we don't remember, the way we calculate this is we move the decimal two to the left. So 0.578, we multiply for of 450 and we can just calculate that. And we get 260.1. Uh, we can't really have a decimal of a person, so I'm going to round that to 260 females. So we would randomly sample 260 females at Chabot, rather than randomly sampling 450 students overall. So let's check how male works. So same idea, 42.2% of 450 will be male. And go ahead and calculate that percent on your own. So move the decimal two to the left and calculate. So I'll pause so you guys can try that without me. So did you get 189.9, which I rounded up to 190? So then again, we would randomly sample 190 males, and then we would combine these to make a new sample of 450 students. And we should double check that. 
those numbers add up to 450. So you can check that on your calculator. And that's what stratified is. So stratified is really nice when you want to study individual groups. So maybe we want to compare male and female students or something after the fact. Um, it's not always gender. Um, we might be interested in age. So my final example will be looking at age. And then I have one combined example, but this is my last one of stratified. So this is also stratified, you'll see that word. And we're interested in age here. So we have 3,332 3, students are 19 or younger. We have 4,393 are 20 to 24. 1859, 25 to 29, right? 2269 in their 30s. And then our final group is 3,222, 40 and over. And so we want to have a sample of size 250, stratified based on age. So we want to make sure age is proportional. This one's a little trickier because percents aren't given. So we have to calculate percents. So we're going to take 3,332 3, and we're going to divide by the total. So I found the total by adding up all the groups. So 3,332 3, plus 4,393. And this will tell me the total students at Chabot. 1859, 2269, and 3222. And quickly on the calculator, I got 15075. And that's the total in my fraction. So then for each age group, we're going to divide to find the percent. So we'll do the number of 19 or younger out of the total. So essentially we're doing 19 or younger divided by total. We get a decimal, we go two to the right, so we're doing the opposite now because we have a decimal and we get 22.10%. So we need 22% of our sample to be 19 or younger. So I'm gonna do that same calculation. I'm gonna do 0 0.2210 times 250, and I get about 15, 55 students 19 or younger. I do the same thing for 20 to 24. I'll do this one fast since it's in the notes already. We do the number of them divided by the total. We get around 29% times it by 250, and we get 73 who are 20 to 24. And now we'll just repeat that for the remaining groups. So let's do 25 to 29. See if you can try that one without me. I'll pause the video for, I'll wait for like 30 seconds on the video so it's not too long. We will go ahead and do the division to find the percent and then times it by 250. All right, hit pause if you want more time. I don't want to make the video too long. So pause if you want to keep trying and then hit play when you're ready. And we're going to do 1859 over 15075. And we get about 0.1233. Um, I'm going to stick with four decimal places and we'll go over this more later, but four decimal places is nice. This is like 12.33%, but we really only need the 0.1233 for the math, times it by 250. And we get about 30.8, so I'll probably round that up to 31. 31, 25 to 29. Cool, so if you wanna keep trying, pause and do the last two. So we'll do 30s. Um, there's 2269 of them, 2,269 out of the total. I highly recommend pausing videos and trying examples on your own, because that's how you're going to learn. I got 0.1505, which is about 15.05%. Right? 
right? One, two, that's how I'm doing that. But we'll just times that by 250. Because the sample size is 250. And I get about 30, a little over 37, 37.6. So I'll round that up to 38 in their 30s. And our final one. We probably could subtract to find the last one, but we should check the math as well. So 40s plus, we have 3222 out of 15075. Quick division. 0 0.1, oops, 0 0.21, 0, 0.2137, right, about 21%, a little more, but we'll just do 0 0.2137 times 250, because we're doing 21% of 250, and we get slightly over 53, 53.4, so 53 students over 40. And the last thing I would do is I would just add those numbers up, make sure they add up to 250 still. So 55 plus 73 plus 31 plus 38 and plus 53. Cool, we still got 250. So we have a random sample of 250, but we have instead randomly sampled within each age group. All right, and this video is a little on the long side, but there's only one example left, so let's just jump into this and we'll be done with section one, three. So our final example is just what kind of sampling methods are they using? You'll see in the question I said they're using two sampling methods, so as we read through this, start thinking about those. I'll maybe highlight things that stand out to me. So every few years, Chabot conducts a student satisfaction survey. Um, simple random sampling is just not practical because there's many busy students and it's really hard to get students to volunteer to come in and spend 30 minutes filling out a survey, right? Most of you wouldn't do that. So instead, they decide to choose whole classes of students and ask the instructors to administer these classes. So classes sound like clusters to me. So that's a sampling method, right? We're using classes as clusters. And then to attempt to ensure we have a good mixture of students, oops, I forgot the X mixture. from classes of various subjects, we equally space them throughout the, cl the classes of schedules, um, the classes of classes. So equally spaced, we may or may not remember, but that was um, the systematic, whenever it's equally spaced. So that could be equally spaced in terms of time, like every four hours. It could also be equally spaced just in the catalog, like classes, so that we get all the subjects, but it's equally spaced. So the two methods here are cluster sampling and systematic random sampling. So sometimes we use more than one method. All right, thanks for listening. Email any questions.